All right, well, welcome everyone. Um, we're so glad to have you here with us today uh, to discuss uh, Jeremy Gallon's new work, uh, Henry Kissinger, L'Européen. Uh, so the question, the question that we're asking tonight is, does Henry Kissinger hold the key to strengthening European democracy? It's an event that has been brought to you by the Franco-American Circle, the Europe Circle, the Franco-British Circle, and uh, the International Affairs Group. Um, before we get started, just a couple of quick rules. So while we're speaking, uh, we're going to have a first uh, portion of the event that will be Jeremy who will be speaking to us about his work. Um, then we'll be opening it up to questions afterwards. So um, if you can keep your mo microphone muted while we're uh, prior to the question and answer period and during question and answers, if you can also in the meantime, post your questions into the chat box, then we'll you know, call on you individually and let you unmute your mics uh, to start asking questions when the time is right. Um, so without further ado, I will now introduce Jeremy. So uh, Jeremy is a lecturer at Sciences Po in diplomacy and EU foreign policy. He's also currently the senior director and head of Europe for the geopolitical consult consultancy firm, uh, McClarty Associates. Prior to assuming this position, he started his career as a lawyer and worked at the World Bank in the Balkans, and he was also the senior political advisor to the EU's ambassador to the United States. So in this role, he covered a broad range of topics, including multilateral and global governance, EU-US cooperation on the migration crisis, UN affairs, and human rights. More recently, uh, Mr. Gallon was also the managing director at Amchan France. Uh, in addition to Henry Kissinger, L'Européen, he has also uh, authored an account of his experiences at a, as a European diplomat in, sorry, as a European diplomat in America during the rise of Donald Trump. And he is also a foreign policy columnist at L'Express. And with that, I will pass it over to you, Jeremy, uh, to speak to us about your book. Well, thank you very much, Danielle. And uh, so uh, very nice uh, seeing you all tonight. Delighted to be with you. Um, particularly delighted because I'm very attached to the Sciences Po Institution. I have the pleasure to uh, teach um, there since now a few years and the honor to teach there. So uh, great, great to be with you. So if I may, I would like just to, to start probably by telling you the reasons why uh, I wanted to write about Henry Kissinger because it may not seem obvious why a 36 years old uh, young French man wants to write about Kissinger. Uh, I think the third, first reason is, um, I would say, the incredible life journey of Henry Kissinger. Is this young uh, Jewish boy uh, was born in 1923 in what would be the art of the Nazi world in Fürth, in the suburb of Nuremberg. Uh, he is someone who young will uh, face anti-Semitism. Uh, very young, he, he takes the habit of. Uh, changing the si on the side of the road when he walks in the street by fear of being attacked and hit by a group of young men. Uh, he's passionate about football, but he has to hide in the stadium when he goes there because after, after 1933, uh, he's prohibited to go to the stadium. Um, and uh, in uh, 1938, at the age of 15, he's obliged to flee uh, from his hometown, from his home country. And he arrives as a refugee in the US, in New York City, at the age of 15 years old, just a few weeks before uh, Crystal Nart. And he arrives with nothing. He has lost uh, everything. He doesn't speak a word of English. And a few decades later, he will become the greatest US diplomat of the 20th century, whatever you think about him. And, uh, and so there is something quite incredible in, his, in this life journey. Uh, it says also a lot about what I think made the strength of the US during most of the 20th century, this ability to draw people from everywhere in the world and give them the opportunity to climb the social ladder and to reach to the highest level. Uh, so I think like there was something of a novel in the life of Kissinger, and it's something that I wanted to, to, to explore. The second reason why I wanted to, to focus on the life of Henry Kissinger, who is a figure I've always been fascinated by since I, I, I'm a teenager, is the fact that he has a life that is made of uh, shades of gray. Uh, you cannot like judge a figure like Kissinger uh, just d'un revers de main, I would say in French. Uh, you cannot like have a Manichaean vision of his life. Um, and, and I think what was important for me was not like 
and I know it's it's an habit of our time to pose myself as a prosecutor of his uh, past actions and not to be a Fouquet in ville of the past actions of a, of a person like Kissinger. No, what I just wanted was to explain what he did, contextualize his actions. And then the reader can judge, can have his own or her own personal judgment. But I just wanted to show that, to use a sentence uh, previously used by Mitterrand a few years before he died, like his life was neither white nor black. Uh, it was necessarily gray and made of uh, of uh, of shades of white and black. And so Kissinger is a, is a character where greatness coexists with vanity, where the seducer cohabits with the uh, manipulator, which makes it incredibly interesting, I think. And so um, I, uh, that the reason why like, uh, he is like, uh, it was like, uh, I think uh, the image of the Cristal de Roche uh, applies very well to, to Kissinger. And the third reason why I wanted to write about Kissinger is because I think like in a way you can say that he's a European tragedy. The fact that this young man was born at the heart of Europe has become the greatest US diplomats, says a lot about Europe when Europe decides like in the 1930s to fall into nationalism, to focus more on its fears uh, than um, trying to, to feed its talents and keeping its talents. But from this Euro European tragedy, in a way, I would like at least to draw a certain number of lessons. And uh, I was wondering which lessons we could draw, we Europeans, from the life of Kissinger in order to build a stronger foreign policy, in order to be able to build a stronger Europe, a Europe that is more relevant in the world of tomorrow. And for me, it was extremely important because I see history as a uh, a way to get a better intelligibility of the present, to use the words of Furet. And also because I think like, and it's something that I will develop in the discussion, and I'm sure that we will have question about this. I think Kissinger is a kind of an exception in the US foreign policy world, uh, in the sense that his tradition, his background is deeply European. He's someone who is intellectually the heir of figures like Talleyrand, Metternich, Castlereagh. And so in this regard, he's deeply European. But he's deeply European, and paradoxically, Europe, in particular the European Union, has completely cut this tie with a, a foreign policy tradition, a European foreign policy tradition of real politics. And then I, I try to define what, what I mean by this concept, which has been a lot misused over the last few decades. So, I think there are the three main reasons why I wanted to talk about Kissinger. And then in my book, there are, I think, two main axes uh, in the book uh, that I try to, to really explore. And, and for, for those of you who have not read the book, the book is a kind of Chinese portrait. I use like a certain number of figures uh, that Kissinger met, uh, like Sadat, Chu Enlai, Li Kuan Yu, Aaron de Gaulle, who play a very important role in his life, but also moments or concepts that played a, a very important role for him. And through like various chapters, I try to describe who he is and what, it, what he has achieved. And so one of the first like line of the book is um, for me, whatever you think about Kissinger is someone who had what I would call a kind of intellectual and human uh, kind of colon vertebral. Uh, what I mean by this is that he is someone who, when he arrived at the White House, was not only a brilliant man, he was also a man who had faced many failures, uh, who had faced many personal tragedies. Like I said that he was a refugee. He, it's something that was ingrained into him that explains a lot about who he was, uh, his, uh, his constant desire to be accepted, even sometimes for this reason to be courtesan, in particular with Nixon, uh, but this kind of insecurity that is a characteristic of Kissinger and that explains a lot about him. But he's also someone who lost 13 members of his family in the Shoah, who basically had his hometown completely destroyed. All what was uh, constitutive of his childhood absolutely destroyed. He's someone who, after a few years, after arriving in the US, 
uh, is someone who will engage as a US soldier going back to Europe during the Second World War to fight against the Nazis in the region he had to leave out of fear a few years earlier. And I think like it has also this experience of the war has really shaped him. He's someone that uh, many people thought that, well, his past then when he went to Harvard, et cetera, has been just very linear uh, without any hurdles. The fact is that when he was at Harvard, he was not accepted at the beginning by the WASP community. He was seen as, a, as an outsider. Uh, and, uh, and then even when he decided to enter into uh, the public service and most political life, uh, he was rejected several times under the Kennedy administration. He was not among the best and the brightest, despite his willingness to uh, join the Kennedy administration. Then under the Lyndon Johnson, he tried again. And the fact is that the door closed. And paradoxically, it's with this man, Nixon, that he had nothing in common, that he will build this kind of incredible duo in the foreign policy world. But he's someone who has faced like many obstacles, many failures before entering into the White House. And when he has 45, when he was uh, 45 years old, he was a man who had been shaped by the series of personal tragedies. Also, like something like a divorce. He's someone who had divorced, who had two children, who, he was not just this young, brilliant man who would arrive in a certain position. And he was also someone who had built a kind of intellectual skeleton. Uh, he's someone who had a kind of intellectual density when he arrived in the White House. And I think it's extremely important because I think he's someone who has been able to think strategically, to think and adopt a long-term perspective because he's someone who had spent 20 years at Harvard reading, studying history, meeting all the key intellectuals of his time, people like Hans Morgenthau, Anna Arendt, Raymond Aron, building strong friendship with them, feeding himself with their thoughts, etc. So I think like this combination of this human like skeleton, intellectual skeleton is very important. And I tried really to, to explore this in the book. And of course, in this regard, Kissinger is the exact opposite of the kind of modern figures that we see in our daily political life or uh, in today's society of people who appear on the front of the stage at the top, in top position and disappear immediately because they don't have this kind of intellectual and human backbone. Um, the second uh, ax that I try to really focus on in my book is more the issue of a European real politic. Um, and, and here, like, I think it's important to, uh, and, and I dedicate an entire chapter to this because I think like the concept of real politic is a concept that has been, as I said, misused a lot over the last few decades. And Kissinger himself was very reluctant to use the word real politic to describe uh, this policy. And he, he was reluctant for two reasons. First, he knew that it was symbol of Machiavellian foreign policy, cynical foreign policy, and he didn't want to be associated to this. The second reason is that he knew that real politic, because it's a German world, was a way for his opponents in the US to constantly remind that he was not a true American, to remind his European identity. But I think like, and there is an historian called John Bew, a British historian who did a, a brilliant work like a few years ago to uh, try to recontextualize and explain the notion of real politic and, and view, by the way, interestingly, like has been a senior advisor in terms of foreign policy to Boris Johnson recently, and he's the man who drafted like the concept paper of Global Britain. Uh, John Bew uh, explained that the notion of real politic appears in 1853 in Germany. Uh, under like it's a, a German activist and intellectual called uh, uh, Ludwig von Rauscho, which who uses this term not to like try to bring any cynical or Machiavellian like idea. It's just like he says, real politics is this kind of uh, assessment of the reality that is just based on a historical understanding, political understanding of the current circumstances of all the political logics, dynamics, etc., without trying to project any form of auto-illusion or ideology. 
So it's just like the definition of real politic. The problem is that the first man who has embodied the concept is Bismarck, of course. And the problem is that Bismarck, and since Bismarck embodied like the concept of real politic, people have associated personal trait of Bismarck to the concept of real politic. But I think like uh, Kissinger was aware that it was not the, the true definition and that if you, you want to think about real politic, the, the true practitioners of real politic were people like Talleyrand, Castlereagh in the UK or Metternich, people who have really fed intellectually uh, Kissinger. Kissinger would dedicated his uh, thesis to Metternich and, uh, and Castlereagh and also wrote a series of articles, in particular one long article uh, about, about Bismarck. And so I'm trying to understand through this book what was uh, the kind of real politic practiced by Kissinger and to which extent could it be implemented in, uh, in today's Europe. And uh, another like very important point for me in the book uh, is that the life of Kissinger shows that diplomacy is very often the choice between several imperfect choices, imperfect options. And that there is a kind of ethics of responsibility for a statesman, and this is the reason why I consider Kissinger as a statesman, to be able to make a choice that you perfectly know that will be deeply unpopular, very uh, probably misunderstood by your, by the public opinion, by like the, the politicians of your time, but you do it because you think that in the long term it's a good option. And, and Kissinger was able, I think, at several moments in his life to make these kind of choices. And it's even, I think, like, uh, it's very brave from him because Kissinger was completely aware that it will feed a kind of hatred toward him, a kind of impopularity. And he, he knew it extremely well because when we talk about Kissinger, we always refer to Metternich, to Talleyrand, but I think like he was very attached to the third one called Castlereagh, who is this man who has been the foreign secretary of the UK between 1812 and 1822, who has been with William Pitt and Lord Palmerston, probably the man who really shaped what has made Britain the great power of the, 90, of the 19th century. And, uh, and Kissinger knew perfectly well that Castlereagh, despite like his grand strategy, despite his diplomatic like cleverness uh, had been like hated by the intelligentsia of his time. People like Lord Byron were insulting him. Uh, he was constantly attacked by the mob in the streets. And at the end of the day, like in 1822, he decided to cut his throat and committed suicide. And so I think like Kissinger had been very influenced by Castlereagh. And he knew by taking certain decisions what it would mean for his public image, for, but he decided to take the responsibility of making certain choices. It doesn't mean that I defend all the choices he made, but I think like there was a kind of courage, the courage of the statesman in, in Kissinger's life. Then we can of course also mention the fact that Kissinger in many regards, if I started my career as a lawyer and if uh, Kissinger was my client, it would be an incredibly difficult client to defend because beyond a series of action that can be criticized, uh, very often his attitude, his personal attitude has not helped him to be seen as sympathetic um, uh, to the public opinion, to his like prosecutors, et cetera. And, and we can discuss this in more detail, but one, for instance, uh, anecdote of this, a symbol of this is the issue of East Timor. Uh, in, uh, it was in 1975, uh, Kissinger did nothing to prevent Indonesia from invading East Timor. He was aware of it. He had a meeting with Suharto the, the eve of the invasion. Uh, you can strategically understand why he made this decision with Ford. The fact is that it was a moment where all the dominoes had fallen in, uh, in Asia and Southeast Asia for the US. And so Indonesia was the last the last ally, strong ally in the region for the US. So there was a willingness of not antagonizing Jakarta. But the fact that at 
there is not one single line, single word, sorry, dedicated to East Timor in Kissinger's memoir. The fact that he lied for decades about his meeting with Suharto say a lot also about like the kind of complexity of the figure of, uh, of Kissinger. There is also a dimension that raises many questions, which is his relationship with his Jewish identity. Uh, like um, Kissinger has been uh, seen sometimes as, uh, well, uh, to, to turn it in another, in another way, like Nixon uh, didn't hesitate sometimes to use like very anti-Semitic stances, statements, uh, um, in his uh, in his daily interactions with with Kissinger, and Kissinger never pushed back, never reacted, and, and so many people in the White House were criticizing Kissinger for this, and uh, and the response of Kissinger to this was like, uh, first, I don't believe at the end of the day that Nixon is a true anti-Semite, and uh, Kissinger was thinking that. Uh, it was better if he was not antagonizing Nixon on this and trying to shape Nixon's foreign policy and continue to have an influence rather than entering into a personal feud with Nixon that would have led to be excluded from the close circle of Nixon and then having no more influence on, on US foreign policy. But again, like you can you can discuss this, this choice and like like many, many other ones. So maybe I, I will stop here. And, and I think that then we can we can discuss probably more in detail certain certain aspects of his life, certain French friendship that have really shaped Kissinger, and also certain controversies uh, around his life. Thank you so much, Jeremy. That was so uh, rich and clear. And um, now I guess we can start kicking off with some some questions. Um, I, for one, would like to start with, with one about your own personal journey writing about this book. Um, because Kissinger is somebody that, you know, we all hear, have heard so much about having been at Seals Po. And I'm curious, uh, what is the most surprising or eye-opening thing that you learned as you were preparing the book um, about his life and legacy? So if I, if I want to mention a, a light note um, in the fact that Kissinger was probably the most uh, unlikely sex symbol of the 1970s. Uh, he was a very glamorous figure. And the fact that this uh, uh, professor, uh, Harvard professor with a very strong uh, German accent, a bit chubby, like he was, uh, it was like uh, someone who was saying like uh, uh, that he didn't have one single muscle. Uh, the fact that he was dating like all the most beautiful like actresses of Hollywood that he was uh, constantly, and he was, by the way, loving being seen by the paparazzi with very beautiful women uh, during his diplomatic visits or he, as a socialite in, a, in DC, in Georgetown, in the kind of mundane dinners, uh, was a surprise to me because I, I didn't really know this aspect of, of his life. But, but I think like um, beyond the fact that it was like, and, and there are many anecdotes that I mentioned in the book that are, um, quite funny about it, but um, it, it says a lot about him. It says a lot about someone who I think had really a kind of inner insecurity. And, and, uh, and for him, like uh, acceding to power was, uh, was the ability to accede to a world that he would never have thought that he would accept to one day. And, uh, and uh, under the Nixon, uh, in the Nixon's White House, one of the key advisors of Nixon told Kissinger, well, you should stop like constantly dated women being seen like in, in the press with this very beautiful actress, et cetera. And, and the fact he said, uh, well, no, like, uh, you know, I went through a divorce. Uh, I had a life of an academic. Uh, now I'm at the end of power. I will enjoy every minute of it. And when I will leave the poor, then I will go back to a more normal life. Uh, the fact is that it was partly true because Kissinger, yes, wanted to give this appearance, but the fact is that um, he was working extremely hard. After every dinner, he was accompanying the actresses in their home, and then he was going back to the White House to work until late in the night. Um, 
is someone also who had like a very serious relationship because like he, he married with Nancy McGuinness who became his second wife and is still his wife today. And uh, they had met like prior to his days in the White House because they had met during the Rockefeller campaign because like Kissinger was very close to Nelson Rockefeller who was his first political mentor and who had been the great opponent of Nixon in the Republican party. So uh, I think like this aspect of his personality is uh, he was quite quite surprising to me. Um, he, and just uh, I will mention one anecdote. Like in uh, in Paris, when he was negotiating with the North Vietnamese, uh, he was seen several times like having lunch with a very beautiful blonde lady and uh, called Jane Cushing, who was a friend of him, uh, and. Um, and so the journalist, so usually was negotiating in the morning uh, with the North Vietnamese. Then he was going to the US embassy in Paris, having lunch there. And then he was very often like leaving the US embassy to go somewhere else. And, uh, and like for days and days, the paparazzi were in front of the US embassy. And as soon as Kissinger's car was leaving the US embassy, they were trying to chase him. And they were constantly losing him. And like uh, everybody was wondering that, who are the person he is spending his afternoon with, etc. And there was like one young journalist uh, photographer at that time called a man you probably know now called Patrick Chauvel, who has been one of the great war reporter, war photograph of our times. And Patrick Chauvel was one of the young photographs on a motorcycle trying to follow Kissinger in the streets of Paris. And one day, like Chauvel, like uh, follows the, the car of Kissinger until Trocadero and lose the care of Kissinger in Trocadero. And the fact is that Chauvel said at this moment, well, I decide to go in the Rue de la Tour, which was very close by, where uh, Chauvel's grandfather was living. And Chauvel's grandfather was uh, a former French ambassador to London, but also someone who had negotiated for France during the Indochina War with the North Vietnamese. And the fact is that he arrives at the apartment of his grandfather, and he saw two policemen in front of the apartment of his grandfather. He knocked on the door and his grandfather opened the door and he saw behind his grandfather, Henry Kissinger. And the fact is that all the journalists were looking for a blonde woman, but the fact is that every afternoon in Paris, Kissinger was going to meet the grandfather of Patrick Chauvel because he wanted to learn from how the French had negotiated with the North Vietnamese at the end of the Indochina War because it was the same counterparts he had in the negotiation during the Vietnam War. Thank you, that's a great anecdote. Um, well, so just as a reminder, if anyone uh, that's here would like to ask a question, please go ahead and add that into the, uh, into the chat. I see Leo Keller has raised his hand. Um, so I will pass it over to him. And then perhaps Olivier, you have a, a question as well, I believe. Yes, of course, I have a, uh, a few comments and uh, a few questions, if I may, uh, Daniel. Uh, and I'll also like to thank you very much for organizing this event, um, leading our, our collabor collaborative uh, work. And of course, I uh, thank Jeremy for his, uh, for his uh, presentation. <clears throat> I must say, I really, really liked uh, Jeremy's book because, um, as he says in the conclusion, it is a sort of... Um, uh, of Crystal, this uh, Kissinger character, where you can you can approach him by different uh, aspects and faces. And I thought this book was uh, amongst the uh, the ones that I read on the character, uh, the one that is uh, both uh, you know light, elegant, substantive, and and really conveys the uh, the thickness, uh, the intellectual thickness, the uh, the personal thickness uh, of this uh, incredible uh, man and. Uh, Really, Jeremy um, puts forth uh, the um, the key um, the key uh, aspects of Kissinger's uh, thinking and his foreign policy, uh, and there are some personal and professional aspects too in the book that were sometimes um, um, uh, forgotten, uh, and that uh, one can really uh, uh, dive into. Um, for example, the, uh, the, the, um, the very early years of Kissinger are well put forth, uh, his uh, identity complex, his uh, willingness to, to be recognized in the US, uh, uh, his uh, remorse sometimes, his paranoia uh, are, are nicely, uh, nicely presented and uh, very instructive. 
uh, and of course, the bulk of the of the book is about Henry Kissinger's uh, real politic that uh, that Jeremy um, uh, really redefines uh, really well as uh, the defense of uh, of the national interests of the U.S., which at the time was uh, was really uh, was really uh, well uh, well made and uh, benefited um, the whole um, monde libre, the free world uh, of the time. Uh, Finally, I'd like to say that I, I really liked uh, how, how Jeremy conveys this very simple idea about um, how Kissinger can be uh, instructive to Europeans uh, in the sense that uh, Jeremy says that it's um, the only thing that is really missing uh, to the Europeans is the, the ambition to have a foreign policy that is the, uh, the common strategic thinking uh, and, and not so much the tools or the institutions to do so, even though some of those um, some of those are, are, are missing. This simple message, the, the, the fact that we should go above, beyond the, the, the national interest, the national selfishness, is something that is, uh, that is really useful to, to hear, even though we, we must have several uh, Jeremy's in the, uh, in the, uh, in the debate uh, in order to, um, to really straight, uh, stress, uh, to really stress the, the, uh, the, the, the importance of this uh, uh, strategic uh, um, wake up call for uh, for Europe. Now the questions that I have for Jeremy are, are, are many fold. Uh, I'd like to um, perhaps start by asking um, him about the um, the the the, uh, the the bad aspects of of, of, of Kissinger. He mentioned uh, the um, he mentioned uh, the. Uh, the uh, what was it that you that uh, that you mentioned? It was uh, it was uh, yes, uh, la, uh, Timon. Uh, but you didn't speak so much about ca the the bombardment of uh, Cambodia and Laos. You didn't speak about the uh, the support uh, to the uh, coup in Chile, uh, nor the um, the the, uh, the 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 support um, to the Pakistani invasion of Bangladesh. I, I wondered if you could come back on on, on those aspects that are really red or black spots in his uh, in Kissinger's uh, um, balance sheet, so to speak. Absolutely. Um, well, first of all, what I thank you very much, Olivier, for for your comments. Um, and of course, what I want to say first is that necessarily, like uh, I think, like the, the topics you mentioned, Cambodia, Bangladesh, Chile, etc., are a topic that generate a lot of controversy. Very often, like people are passionate about it. And my aim is not necessarily to defend Kissinger on this, but to explain why also he has decided he has taken certain position. And um, and I would like also to start by saying that uh, you know there is this um, this word that are supposed to have been pronounced by the Pope uh, Urbain VIII uh, at the death of Richelieu. And uh, the Pope said, well, if God exists, Richelieu should be concerned. But if God doesn't exist, what a happy man. And I think like this sentence could be applied to, to Kissinger too. And the irony, by the way, that Kissinger quotes this sentence in his book, Diplomacy. So then if we go back to, to several things, one, uh, one first thing I think, is uh, Bangladesh. So we are in 1971. Uh, there is like this movement of independence uh, in Bangladesh. Uh, and, uh, and there will be a repression by Pakistan that will be absolutely terrible. Uh, mass rapes, uh, mass violation of human rights, uh, uh, absolutely terrible crimes uh, committed by the, by, by the Pakistani army. Here, uh, it's clear that Kissinger has blocked any voice within the State Department or within like the US administration that was trying to push the US to adopt a more conciliatory position vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Pakistan. Um, I think like, uh, so you can really wonder why he adopted this kind of approach vis-a-vis -vis Pakistan. I think like um, here you have to go back to uh, what was the ultimate goal of Kissinger. The ultimate goal of Kissinger was to basically create um, stability and uh, a kind of equilibrium, even if it was an imperfect equilibrium in a world that could really like, that, could, that was extremely dangerous, the world of the Cold War. And Kissinger was someone who had expanded the Shoah, who had expanded the chaos. Like Metternich, 
and the generation of these diplomats had experienced like the, the aftermath of the French Revolution, the terror, etc. And so he was deeply attached to stability, to avoid any form of chaos. And for him, like the ultimate goal was to prevent the ultimate conflict, which would have been a conflict between the USSR and the US. And to achieve this goal, he, he wanted really to, he was able to consider that there were, I would not talk about compromises to make, but certain difficult choices to make. And on Pakistan, he was fully aware that Pakistan was one of the few key allies of the US in, uh, during the Cold War in the region, and that it was also the only channel of communication to China. And the fact with that, if Kissinger was able to travel secretly to Beijing, establish a relationship to Zhu Enlai that led to the official visit and historical visit of Nixon in February 1972. So the secret trips of Kissinger take place in mid-1971, in July 1971 in, um, in Beijing. It's because he had this connection with Pakistan. And so what I say that, of course, the, the way he behaved vis-a-vis -vis Bangladesh cannot be excused. But if he didn't behave like this, there would not have been a rapprochement with China. And so I just say that you cannot, on the one hand, say congratulations, Mr. Kissinger, for the rapprochement with China, and at the same time criticize him for the position he adopted in the war between Pakistan and Bangladesh. So I think like here, it's a typical example where you have clearly a pass that is made a diplomatic pass of very imperfect options. And he decides to take a responsibility, which is that in the great scheme to favor the rapprochement with China, which he considered that will enable the US to take a decisive step vis-a-vis -vis the USSR above like what he sees as a more local conflict, uh, no matter how terrible it is, which is Bangladesh. Cambodia, uh, again, it's, uh, uh, there has been a, a lot of literature on this. He has been extremely criticized. And just to give the background of where he's criticized is that uh, Kissinger was, and I'm convinced that it's the case, he was aware when he entered into the White House that the US cannot, couldn't win in Vietnam. Uh, and um, just, and it's one of the quality of Kissinger's, like uh, at that time, there were many academics in Harvard, Yale, etc., who were basically criticizing the US government without having never gone to Vietnam. In 1965, so four years before joining the administration, Kissinger said, I want to go to Vietnam. I want to see what happens. There, he went there, he met the US ambassador in Vietnam, Henry Cabot Lodge, and he spent like several days, several weeks on the ground. And he understood that there is no possible military victory uh, for the US. <coughs> but when he arrives in the White House, he also considered that the credibility of the US is not to leave immediately. Because if you leave immediately, and it's an interesting question for the US at the moment of the withdrawal of Afghanistan. But he considered that at that time, if you left immediately from Vietnam, you would lose any form of credibility vis-a-vis -vis over US allies. And in a time of Cold War, it's not something that you could afford. So the bet of Kissinger and Nixon was, we will continue the war for a few additional years, try to improve our negotiating position, and then put an end to the war, but in a more favorable position for us. And he decided to bomb Cambodia because they were clearly Viet Cong position in Cambodia. So the idea that Cambodia was completely neutral was not true. The fact is that there were many parts of Cambodia where the Viet Cong was already present. But then of course, you can question the method. You can question first the scope of the bombing. More bombs were launched on Cambodia than by the Allies during the World Second World War. So an incredible like amount of, uh, of bombs and devastation. And secondly, it was kept secret from the Congress for a very long period of time, something that would probably be impossible uh, today. So of course, again, I'm not trying to say uh, that he was right or wrong. I'm just trying to contextualize Chile 
and like many other uh, of his decision take place in a context of uh, Cold War again, where he considered that it's better to support a regime uh, even in a way atrocious uh, and violating human rights, but in the Cold War on the side of the US, aligned with the US interest, rather than the regime of Allende, which was, by the way, and it should also be remind, reminded, the regime of Allende was not only fought and opposed by uh, the Nixon administration and Kissinger, the Kennedy administration and the Johnson administration did everything they could through the CIA and through other uh, means to try to undermine the Allende regime in Chile, because they consider that Allende had a kind of political posturing that could have been seen as dangerous for US interest in the region. There was also at some point um, uh, a kind of, I would not describe as an alliance, but at least rapprochement between uh, Castro and Allende that created a lot of uh, fear in Washington DC, etc. So Kissinger arrived in this context, he pursued a policy with Pinochet. Of course, you can criticize him. You can also criticize him, by the way, not only for Chile, but for Argentina where he has been always very sympathetic with the kind of uh, uh, Argentinian dictatorship of Videla, even after he left power. Um, and, uh, and so, again, like uh, it's an example of a crisis where you could criticize Kissinger, but it takes place in a broader context, the context of the Cold War. Uh, we could also mention Cyprus. We could mention like other uh, examples where he had an attitude and uh, he, he decides to uh, adopt certain policies that, of course, are open to a lot of criticism. Thank you. Thank you, Jeremy. Um, Leo, would you like to, to ask yes. a question? Yes, do you hear me? Yes. Yes. OK. Uh, Mr. Gallon, I like very much your book. You can see it. I noted much. many pages. Uh, I, it's difficult for me to talk and I would like thank, uh, to thank Olivier Marty because he invited me. Uh, I have a few points where I agree or I would precise or I would, uh, you said you're not here to, to defend Henry, who was called at that time, dear Henry. So I have a few points, if you allow me. First point is uh, in history, you have to contextualize in the past, in the time, and in, the, in a geographical point of view. So uh, concerning Chile, uh, I wouldn't have said this a few years ago, but now I have to admit that, uh, first of all, he was not the first one to do these things. Remember what the CIA did. Remember the United Fruits role in uh, Latin America and so on. Remember how many, I remember when Kennedy didn't disagree uh, when the CIA uh, killed uh, Godin Diem, you remember. So he was not the first and Kissinger said very clearly uh, and don't, as you mentioned it so frequently, he knew what was chaos and dictatorship. So he said concerning Chile, I don't see why we have to stand by and watch a country go to communist because of the, the irresponsibility of its own people. So this is to explain what uh, he didn't. Also, there is no proof that he wanted to, to, to assassinate uh, Allende. Of course, he didn't avoid it. Now, I, there, there is one point uh, you said uh, your book is Kissinger L'European. Uh, Kissinger was invited recently at a meeting with the IFRI, and he said that his nightmare would be that the fate and the values of United States and Europe would diverge. Now, concerning the credibility, uh, till now, my doxa is not um, fixed. Because uh, remember, uh, when uh, the Americans lost the Vietnam and what happens in Saigon, uh, we could say it was a huge loss of credibility. But nevertheless, it didn't, uh, um, uh, it didn't uh, disallow Henry Kissinger to go on to pursue 
on other fields and to build an American policy. So uh, 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 my doxa once again is not fixed and I'm not sure that it was a, a fear of lack of credibility. It was in fact, most probably because exactly as General de Gaulle wanted to get rid of Algeria because he had other projects, Kissinger, as you mentioned it very, <coughs> very cleverly, uh, when he went to Vietnam, he realized it was a lost battle. So uh, the, main, the two main qualities of Henry Kissinger and I have to tell, I'm a fan of Kissinger. I've been, uh, till now I read his books every, every week. Uh, one of his two main achievements is that he said once, the main difference between a diplomat and a statesman is that a diplomat thinks he can um, achieve peace and realize with success every uh, settlement. And the statesman knows perfectly that there are some uh, situations where you have no solution. And he said, for example, concerning the Middle East, he said it to Gromico, I think, he said, uh, we, I won't be able to make peace between Israelis and Arabs because the Arabs are hysterical and the Israelis are cynical. Now, it's a personal point of view. Maybe I'm wrong and I'm probably wrong. First of all, when you arrive at this level of responsibility, uh, you have a certain ego, okay? Uh, and uh, you enjoy power and you enjoy power for various reasons. So you know that uh, Henry Kissinger uh, was a, um, working uh, on a free basis with K uh, Kennedy's administration for nuclear uh, policy. It was after he wrote his fabulous book. I loved it, Nuclear Power and Foreign Policy. So uh, as he disagreed with Kennedy, all in a sudden he decided to stop taking the shuttle New York, Washington, and he didn't cooperate anymore. Now- Leo? Uh, yeah. This is very all very interesting. Um, could okay, we perhaps I, give um, Jeremy a chance to re to respond, and then perhaps allow others to ask questions okay. as well? Sorry, it's, for it's, my land. <laughs> no, thank just, you. I'm sure just, Jeremy's pleased to have one. heard your opinion and know that you've read the book. Um, well, uh, thank you very much, Mr. Keller. Uh, it, it was, uh, I think, all your comments were incredibly insightful and, and, and interesting, and, and thank you very much for. Uh, sharing with us your, your thoughts on this. I think like you, you're uh, on the issue of credibility, I, I completely agree with you. I also really question uh, the strength of the argument because as you said, like it has not prevented the US then to build over alliances uh, even after the fall of Saigon in 1975. I think the in this regard, like the fall of Saigon is interesting because uh, paradoxically, uh, Kissinger, has been attributed the Nobel Peace Prize uh, for the end of the Vietnam War, which appears like uh, in 1973, but for the next two years, it's an absolute disaster. And the collapse, it led to the collapse of Saigon in 1975. So I think like when I think about Vietnam, I am also thinking about how sometimes the public opinion can be blinded and how like the kind of modern times cannot see really the reality of the situation. 1973, negotiation after the negotiation uh, on Vietnam, he has the Nobel Peace Prize. 1975, Helsinki, uh, and uh, it enables us to, to discuss the issue of detente. Uh, it's of course the conference of Helsinki. Uh, and here and there, Kissinger and Ford takes a very brave position to defend an agreement with the USSR of Brezhnev. And they are extremely criticized in the US for this. Basically, you have the left wing that is saying, well, you are, uh, you are still keeping uh, a stance that is too strong vis-a-vis -vis the USSR. And on the right side of the political spectrum and the right side of the Republican party, you have people like Reagan in particular who are attacking Ford and Kissinger as betraying the US interest in Helsinki. And the fact is that the final act of Helsinki 
uh, is, you know, uh, as you all know, like there are these various buckets, but there is one bucket dedicated to human rights that is at that time completely underestimated by the commentators, by the political analysts, by the public opinion, while the fourth bucket of the Helsinki Act will lead to all the dissenting movements in, uh, in particular in Eastern Europe, Solidarność in Poland, et cetera, Vaclav Havel in, in Czechoslovakia, et cetera. And ultimately, it will play a major role in the end of the USSR. So in the policy of détente and on the Helsinki Act, there was the basis of, at the end, like uh, the US winning the Cold War. But Kissinger was attacked and extremely criticized on this specific aspect by uh, the, the public opinion of his time. And so here, I think like it's a very interesting example for what was at the end of the day, a kind of failure, or at least a very, very limited diplomatic success, Vietnam. He was attributed the Nobel Peace Prize for Helsinki, where he was visionary, where he was building a foreign policy in the long term, very strategic, that at the end of the day, a few decades later, was really the basis of the US winning the Cold War. He was criticized. Ford lost against Carter in 1976, partly because of this. So Ford also made a huge political sacrifice in Helsinki because he knew perfectly the domestic political consequences of taking this position. And, and so I think here you have also a kind of, of, uh, of a very interesting example of sometimes like uh, the statesman who takes long-term position, but knows that he will pay the consequences of this. And it reminded me like there was this very beautiful book written a few years ago by Metin Arditi, who is a great novelist, but who also wrote a very beautiful essay a few years ago about Machiavel. And uh, Metin Arditi was writing, the prince is the one who is able to sacrifice his own personal interest for the common good. And here, when Ford and Kissinger decide to pursue the Helsinki Act and the policy of detente, it's exactly what they are doing. And the irony of this is that Reagan was criticizing them extremely strongly, basically weakened Ford in the Republican Party on this. And in the mid 1980s, Reagan himself was obliged to recognize that uh, the, the Helsinki Act was probably the, the funding uh, element of the, the future uh, win of the US in, in the Cold War. So uh, I, I wanted to mention this aspect because it, it's also, I think, a, a very interesting, interesting aspect. The other thing that we have not mentioned, and maybe I, I would like to, if there, there are questions about it, is to probably mention also the friendships that have really shaped uh, Henry Kissinger. And I think you cannot talk about Kissinger without talking about Lee Kuan Yew, the uh, founding father of Singapore, who had a tremendous influence of uh, of, uh, of Kissinger, Sadat, of course, uh, they, it was nearly like a relationship of brothers between Sadat and Kissinger and Chu Enlai, uh, the right hand of Mao, who is the man who has really brought Kishin Kissinger into the Chinese culture, who has led him to be fascinated by this country. So, but uh, I don't know if there are, Daniel, over questions, otherwise I'm happy to, to, uh, to dive in this kind of question. Um, actually, we do have some questions that have come in through the chat. And I've also noticed that we have uh, Frank Guerri, who is also our um, co-sponsor and a president of the uh, Europe Circle, who has joined us and has a question to ask. So I'll pass it over to Frank and then we'll take maybe a question out of the chat. Thank you very much. Uh, and indeed, I wanted to, to raise a question. Uh, uh, some of us know that Kissinger was also very uh, admirative to, to Jean Monnet, uh, and uh, based on your experience also in the in the, the European uh, in European affairs, wanted to to raise uh, a point regarding the, the way uh, our diplomacy in European Union is working, and what uh, Henri Kissinger could advise regarding the way to make it more. Uh, efficient and uh, regarding qualified majority versus unanimity. And I, I wanted to, based on your own experience and your uh, analysis of the thinking of uh, Henri Kissinger, how you would, uh, what is your thinking about, about this and what Henri uh, Kissinger could, could recommend in that regard? No, it's, it's, it's a very good question. And thank you very much, Frank, for, for this question. I think like it's always difficult to say Henry Kissinger would say this because it would be incredibly arrogant uh, 
to, to, to say this. So, uh, but I think like based on uh, what he achieved and based on his, uh, on his thinking, I would assume that first he would call Europe to stop being like um, uh, an entity that thinks itself in a, under a software that is a software of the end of history uh, conceptualized by Fukuyama. Uh, I think like he, he would have said to Europe, like you are in a geopolitical competition with like other actors that don't think like you that are trying to undermine you. So you have to think as a power and not that only as, a, as an entity that could only have friends and not enemies. Uh, so uh, I think it, it would be one of his, one of his thoughts. Uh, what does it mean concretely? Concretely, it means that, for instance, sometimes you have to uh, use your tools, your assets, to uh, strengthen your foreign policy. For instance, I think like there is something that is absurd in European foreign policy today that our main assets at the EU level, our trade, trade tools, we are a trade power. Uh, our assets, in front, for instance, in terms of development, we are the major provider of development across the world. We have so a certain number of regulatory tools also that we can use, etc. But we are not connecting them, or for instance, in terms of energy, we are a massive consumer of energy, but we are never connecting like these tools with our foreign policy. The EU diplomatic service, so the European External Action Service, is completely separate from the services of the Commission in charge of trade, in charge of development, in charge of energy. So basically, what could be our key levers? of influence foreign policy are not under the authority of the people who shape and implement our foreign policy. So this disconnection is already a massive problem. And, and I saw this like, uh, just as an anecdote, like in any EU delegation, so because we, we talk about EU delegation, not EU embassy to uh, not threaten our member states who would be uh, jealous of having also EU embassies, you have like, the person who reports to DEFCO, so the, the, the development agency of the EU, who is completely independent from the ambassador. So basically, she, she uses her or his credit in terms of development without reporting to the EU ambassador. So even in an EU embassy, the European ambassador is not able to use the leverage of the development funds to shape foreign policy on the ground. It's just like something that doesn't work. Secondly, you mentioned the issue of qualified majority. Of course, we cannot continue to have a foreign policy that require unanimity. Like uh, it means that on any crisis, you can be blocked by tomorrow, like uh, Cyprus, uh, when you want to discuss like Turkey or any other uh, small country on any issue. By the way, it could be said the same, not only in terms of foreign policy, but also in terms of taxation, as we have seen. Uh, recently. So uh, there are, of course, a certain number of institutional hurdles that we should overcome. But beyond this kind of institutional hurdle, what I want to mention, uh, what I try to explain in the book, is that there are two things that don't need a revision of the treaty. First thing is trying to think strategically, think in the long term, uh, develop uh, a foreign policy that is adapted to the challenges we face. Another example, the Syrian crisis. Danielle mentioned in uh, her introduction that when I was a diplomat for the EU, I was working a lot on migration issues. And it was during the first migration crisis in 2014, 2015. I was struck to see that on the Syrian crisis, which was a crisis that was directly impacting the stability of Europe through the flow of migrants, through uh, its consequences on the evolution of our political narrative, political spectrum with the rise of the far right in many European countries. The fact is that Europe as, a, as the EU was not even present at the table of negotiations on the Syrian crisis. So basically on Syria, we were issuing statements on a regular basis, criticizing the violation of human rights, but we were not even able to sit at the table of the negotiation. We were not even able to shape the way the crisis was evolving while we were the major providers of development and humanitarian aid in the region. And for me, like, there is a real responsibility of the people who shape and design our foreign policy there. Because 
Of course, you can give yourself good conscience because you issue on a regular basis a statement criticizing the violation of human rights of Bashar al-Assad. But if on a daily basis, you are not able to shape the, the way the crisis takes place, if you are not able to put the EU at the negotiation table, I think you have also a responsibility here. So uh, it's one thing, think more strategically, think more in terms of interest, spheres of influence, borders, words and concepts that are still taboos to a certain extent in Brussels. And the second thing would be also in the way of the, the choice of people who conduct our foreign policy. Kissinger, and I insisted a lot on this, was a man and is a man who was endowed with a kind of intellectual skeleton, intellectual backbone, and this kind of human backbone, human density, thickness, to, to use the word of Olivier. And, and I think like it's what has enabled him to be a statesman. I'm sorry to say this, but I don't think like people like Joseph Borrell or his predecessors, Federica Mogherini or Catherine Ashton can be compared in this regard. They don't have the same kind of intellectual backbone than uh, a Kissinger had. And I think this is a real problem. But by the way, this is not only a problem at the EU level because it also raises the question of why our member states and why our national leaders are afraid of appointing at the EU level people who could be great statesmen, who could be able to shape a strategic foreign policy and would be able to connect with European citizens. And I think like at the end of the day, so far, we have had like French president, German chancellors, who have been kind of afraid of pushing people, very strong figures at the EU level who could create a shadow for them. Thank you very much, Jeremy. Um, we're a little bit past the, the time. Uh, we do have one question from someone who hasn't been able to speak yet. It's Matthew King. Can, can we take one final question? Is that okay with you? Of course. Okay. Um, Matthew, are you still there? Would you like to, to go on, Mike? Yeah. Sure, good evening, everyone. Um, I was just asking uh, about something that Dr. Kissinger often says, which is that if Europe doesn't develop a strategy of its own, it is doomed to become an appendage of Eurasia. And I was wondering, um, you know, not what, what you would say, uh, putting on your Kissinger hat, but what you would say just in response to that, given your experience in European diplomacy. Thank you. Thank you very much, Matthew. I think, yes, in your question, there is a fundamental question. I think like for, uh, for our times as European, which is a question of the potential irrelevance of Europe. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm, I don't want to be part of a generation that will be only a spectator of history, that will not shape history. And, uh, and I think like Europe has all the assets to shape the world of tomorrow. We are a massive trade power. We have like, if you combine all our military spending, we have the second biggest spender in the field of defense. Uh, we have, I think, also an history that enables us more than anyone else to understand the complexity of the current world. Um, uh, but um, the problem is that I think like we don't think of ourselves as Europeans as a power. We don't think of Europe as a power. Uh, just to give you an example, I was struck by the fact that in 2019, when he went for a state visit in Greece, Xi Jinping said, uh, we Chinese and Europeans, we share one thing, we are a civilization. And you know, I was struck by the fact that we need to have a Chinese leaders, by the way, we're trying to undermine Europe through the New Silk Road, through various strategies of influence, but who's reminding us Europeans that we are a civilization. That between the construction of the, Acrop of the Parthenon and now, there are 24 centuries of history on which we could build like a kind of strategy, a strategic vision for Europe. But the problem is that we are reluctant to do so. And, and I think here Kissinger is completely right. If Europe on an urgent basis is not able to uh, think more strategically to develop a real European foreign policy, because let's be honest, at the level of member states today, we don't have like the leverage to, to influence the world. Uh, even as France, we still have military capabilities. We still have 
uh, diplomats with a lot of talent, but the fact is that alone, we cannot shape the world. So it's at the European level, we can do it. But if we don't have the willingness to do so, and the same can be said in terms of defense, I don't say necessarily a European army, which is a very controversial concept, but at least think about how we could increase our spending in the field of defense, how we could at least develop, for instance, a European pillar of NATO. Well, if we are not able to think strategically in terms of also of industrial policy, yes, we will become an appendix of Eurasia. And worse than this, we will not be able to transmit our values to the next generations. We will just be the spectators, the witnesses, of a world shaped by the US, by China, by other powers. And, and the fact is that all the challenge is here. And that's the reason why I'm thinking that Kissinger is so precious for us. Because as a believer that he's the man who can, in a way, paradoxically, because he's American, but connect us with the one who are thinking strategically in Europe, like in the 19th century, Talleyrand, Metternich, Castoret, and prior to them, people like Bismarck or Richelieu, as he is the connection, is the one who could show us how to build this more European uh, strategic Europe. Thank you, Jeremy, and thank you. You've been so generous with your time. Um, with that, I think we're going to, to close the, the web conference. Uh, thank you for sharing so much. Um, it's been very insightful. I know that everyone's enjoyed uh, listening to all of your answers and hearing more about your book. On that note, um, I'm going to, for anyone who's interested in learning more about uh, Jeremy's book, I'm going to put the link to uh, its page on the FNEC in the chat um, so that you can go and check that out. Um, so thank you everyone for coming. Thank you, Jeremy, for speaking uh, so eloquently and, and persuasively about Kissinger and what he can teach us about uh, how to strengthen diplomacy in Europe today. Um, thank you to Oliver uh, and Frank as well for you know, participating in the uh, organization of the event. Um, and we look forward to seeing you at future events uh, soon. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you, Jeremy. Thank you.